Thanks, everyone. Okay, so I'm here. We have a big agenda, so let's uh, get away uh, right into it. So I'll talk about the recent evolution of server-side malware. So um, what it used to be and now what it, it kind of became. We'll attack one particular campaign that we analyzed uh, during the past two years, which is Operation Windigo, which we released a big report about. We'll touch on the subject of are the malware operators using DevOps principle, and we'll show some examples of why we think so. And then we'll dive into forensic and incident, incident response and uh, you know, help you uh, deal with the threats. Uh, who am I? I'm Olivier Bilodeau. I work as a malware researcher at ESET, a Slovak company, uh, Eastern Europe company. I'm a, I've been an info security lecturer uh, in Montreal at university. I also uh, did some uh, open source development in Perl, uh, writing for um, Inverse, the packet fence network access control uh, program. And I did in the past also Linux, uh, Unix type sysadmin and uh, for a large Canadian ISP. I work directly on the Operation Windigo report I'm going to describe today. And I, I did some reverse engineering on it. We, I uh, built some honeypots for it, did the uh, written in the report, did uh, spam analysis, and uh, written a fake uh, spam bot uh, in Perl for it. So I'm pretty familiar with the topic here. But first, so let's get everyone moving after lunch. Uh, so everyone, I would like you to get up. I, it's real. Get up, please. <laughs> It won't be long. So, okay. I see people still sitting down now. Come on, come on up. All right. So sit down if you never touched a Linux system before. That's, that's what I expected, right? <laughs> sit down if you never administered a Linux system before. So as a, like, a, you know, doing maintenance on it and stuff. Okay. Sit down if you never worked professionally as a Linux system administrator. All right. Sit down if you never done incident response or forensic on a Linux system. Wow, that's good. Great audience. I'll have fun today. Uh, sit down um, if you aren't a distro developer, so an active distributor or working uh, in the <laughs> vendor. All right. <laughs> Nice. Okay. So enough with the silly commands. Let's uh, dive into the topic. So before, what we used to see was old school defacement. This is one of the fancy one with a sound in it. But it was uh, hackers that were uh, motivated by visibility, showing off their skills, and also finding low-hanging fruits uh, websites that were uh, easy to compromise. Some of them may be harder. Uh, you can find a big list of most defacements still in, on the zone-h.org website, which uh, hosts them. So this was really um, like an animated GIF, background music type of, you know, kind of kid-looking stuff, if you want. There's also uh, old-school damage. So before, what you saw a lot uh, for malware or stuff was uh, uh, motivated by, uh, to do damage because of hatred or personal uh, issues with the company or maybe past employees. We saw a lot of that too. And uh, the RM-RF could be hidden you know, uh, really well, uh, carefully. Uh, uh, it, uh, so uh, it's a declination of, if you want, this, this thing. What we've seen as an evolution is that um, now it's uh, what we call crimeware, because it's motivated by, by money, and it, it makes decision like, uh, you know, we won't spend money or time developing this, this against this target because it's not a good return on investment, if you want. So uh, the, this means that the, the threat that are targeting the servers are really specific, and it leverages the server's property, which are that it's always up, good uptime. It's almost always reachable. So uh, the threats we see for Linux aren't uh, targeting desktop uh, users mostly. Uh, servers have good bandwidth, they have good IP reputation, and the IP reputation is maintained by the, the system administrators. So if the server ever gets blacklisted, someone else, then the criminal, will take care of, of uh, bringing back the good IP reputation, you know, delisting, trying to clean, it, clean the server and everything. And also it may contain sensitive information which is interesting, uh, interested, uh, uh, which is interesting to them to steal. 
So why people should care about crimeware on Linux server? Uh, it's not, it doesn't affect directly the servers now anymore since it tries to leverage this, these uh, characteristics. It's, uh, you, sh you should care about it because you will eventually get blacklisted and anyone visiting your website will get the Google, you know, uh, like this site uh, served malware in the past. So there are several blacklists in, um, in effect. There is an antivirus company blacklist, so where web visitors get a warning. There's the spam house uh, XBL, which is uh, the server cannot send email anymore, which is a very popular list, and this is one of the, we get the most interest of people infected through being blocked by spam house. And there's the Google Safe Browsing API, which uh, is in effect in Chrome and Firefox. Microsoft has something similar. So it's bad for your traffic, and it's bad for uh, reputation also. So let's look at a, a recent history of the, the, of the pieces of crimeware we were able to find uh, on, the, on the web. The, the basic stuff, old school stuff, used to be um, HT access redirection. So people were doing mod rewrite rules inside an HT access file to, do, uh, to uh, send traffic to an uh, external site which would host JavaScript and or you know, show ads and stuff like that. The infection ve vector is usually a vulnerable, vulnerable web application, you know, with easy uh, remote command execution and or credential stealing and uh, brute force. And even if you had only user level access, you can still drop the HT access file. So this would happen. An example of that is something as simple as that. This, uh, what it does is, if uh, the, um, the, the client, the, 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 the person browsing on your website, is coming from Google, Ask, Yahoo, Badoo, YouTube, anything like that, you will get redirected. Otherwise, you are not redirected, which is uh, kind of interesting because most system administrators, when they test, they will type in directly the, the, the website and will not be re redirected through Google, which is a kind of an easy step for them to avoid uh, being detected. Then, uh, what we saw, and uh, one of my colleagues, Sebastien Duquette, blogged about uh, this campaign, which we call the home campaign, is uh, Dark Leash. So it's an Apache module uh, that was uh, redirecting web traffic also. The advantage of using a module is that it could avoid doing the uh, logging, while as if, if you use the HT access capability, you are, uh, you are in the logs, you are traces, so you could know when you got infected and stuff like that. But uh, this requires privileges to be able to install this, the Apache module, of course. And it was usually uh, compiled directly on the servers. Uh, it was, we found that it was sold on uh, Russian forums for uh, $1,000. So it's kind of a malware as a service, uh, if you want. And so since it was sold, it, it was used by different people uh, for dif different purposes. As soon as uh, we blogged about it, it's when they started selling it. So instead of, uh, I guess they were afraid of getting caught, so they said, oh, let's have it everywhere on the internet so they will have a hard time tracing back to the original authors. This is the ad uh, that was seen in, uh, in forums online. So it, it has like features and stuff. So this is how, you know, malware is, is sold right now. And then uh, you, there is some more fancy uh, malware, which is uh, uh, Phalanx and Phalanx 2, uh, such a type. It's a rootkit, so it's inside the kernel. Very effective and clever. Uh, it hooks syscalls by injecting code inside the kernel. But since the kernel moves quickly, and this is not, you know, API or, you know, ABI uh, compatible, um, it, it, it will break uh, sometimes. And I think this is why we've seen people going away from the rootkit model in, uh, instead of uh, using now the, the things I will uh, explain later on. So now they're more on the user land stack because it's, it's a lot easier to have your, your malware work against several distributions, several version of Linux and not be binding, uh, binding inside the kernel like this, these guys were doing. So one interesting thing of this rootkit also is that it did all its job before it finishes loading and then it returned an error. So the module would in effect never be loaded if you do use LSMod or stuff like that because it, it would fail to load but it would have still hooked all the syscalls it needed to hook. So it kind of successfully infected the machine without being still uh, loaded. So 
now I'll describe Operation Wendigo. So what is uh, specific about this threat is that all of the infrastructure, so the server side uh, things that they are doing, is all uh, operated on compromised servers. And there are many layers of servers used. We will see a, a diagram later on about it. Uh, but the, the, the end goal of the, all, this, all this thing is still sending, uh, doing traffic redirection and sending spam. So it's, it's pretty, you know, uh, uh, not, not, you know, hardcore uh, erasing servers and, uh, you know, uh, DDoS and, and a botnet thing. It's really about making money. This is why we dubbed this again uh, Crimeware. So it's several pieces of malware that I will describe uh, shortly. But first, uh, who uh, worked on this operation? So uh, they are, these are the people who worked to, uh, with us. Uh, you have a CERTbund, which is the German uh, CERT, government CERT. There's the CERN. We know these guys from the Hadron Collider, but they also have a, you know, good uh, um, IT people there. And uh, so um, they, they, they did help us greatly in, uh, during this analysis. And there is uh, ESNIC, which is the Swedish National Infrastructure for Computing, uh, which helped us also during this investigation. And uh, we also collaborated to have access to servers with law enforcement. And there is an, an ongoing case right now with them. So Linux Ebery uh, is the, the basic, if you want, of all this operation, which makes everything else possible. It's an open SSH backdoor, so you are, they are really at an interesting place where they can get easily a shell and when they can interact with the network, also with the tunnels. Uh, it, it's avoiding logging when it's doing its malicious payload, so it, it leaves no trace. And it steals all passwords and keys. So everything that is uh, connecting from an infected server will get stolen, including encrypted and decrypted version of the keys. And anything connecting to the infected server will also be stolen. Uh, and no matter if it's a successful password or not, it will steal it and steal the state of it. So did it work or didn't it work? Um, the name was given by uh, Steenar uh, Gunderson in November in 2011. We used to call it SSH door before, but uh, we, we liked the Ebery name and a lot of people were already using it, so when we found out, we switched to it. Um, the way it, 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 it works in the past, it used to replace the binary directly, so SSH, SSHD, and SSH add for uh, hooking into SSH agent uh, were all replaced. But then it, it decided it was easy to do an MD5 hash of the, the SSHD binary and compare it with a clean system. So they decided to do everything in an external library, which is not an open, SSL, open SSH specific, which is a general purpose library, but that would detect that when the code path was from uh, uh, open SSH or SSHD, then it would do its, its hooking. So this is something very common on the Windows side of the, of the world and on uh, Windows malware. But on Linux malware, it's not something we saw very often, which was uh, interesting to us to see. And now, since the libkeyutil size of the library increased by 23k of code, it was an easy way to tell if it was infected or not. So when we started telling people to look at the file size of their libkeyutils, the guys, what they did in, instead is now they put in everything in a new library, which is uh, libns2 in this case. I think right now it's libns3 that they call it. And then mo still modify libqtil to load this additional library so the indicator of looking for the size of the library is not good anymore. And they've been, you know, going back to the hard-coded binaries and do doing lib uh, the libqtil trick and or libns2 and they move around these, these different techniques now. So how the shared library works, uh, it has a construction fo uh, function which is e executed when loading. Um, it detects that it's an, an executable that it wants to, to hook, uh, that it will, uh, it will do. It hooks the important functions that it wants to do, and um, it uses DL open to detect the, the, the address space of the main executable to get the address, and then it will patch the code inside the main executable to redirect the functions to the, the new code that is in libqutils. So uh, on the, if you, we look at the assembly for the, the way the hooking works here, you, you can see clearly that it makes the segment read-writable and then put it back read-only and then, you know, uh, move the, the address inside. So what does it look like when, it's, uh, when you analyze a bin binary? 
Well, this is a key parse function that is clean, so you see that it's calling key parse private tem. But after it's hooked, and by the way, you, you need to you know, get it out of memory if you want to see something like that, because on the disk, of course, it will be, uh, it will be the good code path. But when it, once it's hooked by the code we saw two slides earlier, it will look like this, so a pointer to an address, which is now where the function inside the libqtl is loaded. How is the, the, the credential information uh, exfiltrated from the server? It's using DNS. So it was sent a DNS packet with username, a target IP address, and port, and it uses RSA to uh, encrypt it. So you, you, you cannot see it. I, I'm not even sure now is it, if it's encrypted or signed, but anyway, we cannot tamper with the, the thing. It's well done. And since the keys are too large to fit inside DNS, the um, the uh, keys are stored in shared memory in the, on the server, and you can fetch it later using the xcat command. So uh, the, the backdoor supports new commands which are, are not in the SSH protocol, and you use one of these commands to extract the, the keys. One interesting thing about the DNS packets going out is that if you have a TCP dump running uh, with an interface in promiscuous mode on the server, it will stop sending leaked credentials. So it's so it's kind of self-aware. You know, it will, uh, it will uh, you know, try to trick system administrators if you want. The, the way you interact with the backdoor is uh, using a password which is added to the SSH client string, which is something that you can do easily. You don't break any RFC if you do. So this is kind of a hard-coded uh, password. It used to be uh, directly compiled into the server's code so you could easily uh, find it and then trigger the backdoor on your own system if you want. But now it's hashed, so you would need to break the hash uh, first and then uh, use it or sniff traffic because this is not in the, the encryption layer yet. The, the, the commands that are supported by the backdoor is uh, xver, which is, uh, prints the version installed. They do versioning, which is kind of nice when we track them. We have like nice uh, like version, this version does that, this version does that. Uh, you can print stolen credentials. Uh, xbind is interesting because you, you kind of, they kind of added a feature that they needed for the SSH tunnels. So we'll see later on why they use SSH tunnels. But uh, the XBind allows them to choose the IP address that the tunnel will be out uh, from. So this for them, I, I don't think OpenSSH supports that, or if it does, it's recent. And so they needed that in ancient version 2 because they infect POSIX systems, you know, they see a lot of different OpenSSH. And so they added this feature. And uh, X password uh, is uh, setting a new key for the future backdoor use, so changing the default key that is compiled in. And if you, do, you put in no command at all, you get a shell. So they, they don't need to authenticate. They like trigger it with the version string I mentioned in this slide. The other piece of malware, which is, so with the OpenSSH, they have access to servers. They are root. And, uh, mo and uh, then they, they do their thing uh, for web redirection, which they use the CDOR component for. CDORC is an HTTPD, Nginx, or lighted HTTPD backdoor. It's uh, maintaining, so they, uh, they have patches that they maintain to support all of these, uh, these binary, they, these servers. It will redirect HTTP requests uh, from legitimate websites to exploit pack or affiliate ads, so uh, casino, adult, uh, dating type of things. It will use uh, uh, shared memory, so SHM, uh, for state and configuration. So nothing is in the binary and uh, nothing is on disk. So you need to get a memory, a memory dump of the, the shared memory if you want to know uh, what was the condition to, pro to do the redirections. Uh, it's encrypted with a static XOR key, which is unique per infection. So uh, this component is installed on a small subset of the Iberi infected server. It's not everyone. And they will replace the binary on the server. So if you do uh, MD5s and stuff, you will see it's not the same as the original one. And they, uh, they put a lot of effort into making the patch really uh, cross uh, server, so they, they have less work to do. And we've noticed since that we published our report, what happened a lot is that they install CDORC in, uh, now instead of using any sites that they could use before. They mostly target porn sites. 
And we were like, hmm, why would you target porn sites? And we realized, like, how many people who get ads or who get redirected to binary downloads that will, uh, will report to a porn site, hey, you tried to infect me, you know, or something like that. So we figured this is a, a matter of, uh, for them to stay stealthy. Talking about stealthy, this is the, all the conditions. So the, these are all ifs in yellow, if you want. And then in red is the redirection. We perform the redirection and do the JavaScript injection. So it's, uh, these are all conditions that it will uh, not redirect a user for. So if, for example, uh, it's seen your IP in the last 24 hour, it will not redirect you again. If in the URL uh, of the, the, the websites, there, there is strings like cPanel, secure, bill, admin, etc., it will not redirect you to the exploit pack. If um, the, there is a specific accept language string, so at some point, uh, some of the researcher in the community was saying, you guys are full of shit, this is not, uh, this is, it's not real that uh, this malware uh, works like that because I cannot reproduce your, your findings. And then what we, we realized is he was using a browser that was set to Japanese, and Japanese user will never be infected by this trip. So <laughs> that's why he wasn't able to reproduce what we, we were seeing. Uh, uh, interestingly, like Ukrainian, uh, Russia, Japanese are languages that will never get infected, so uh, we don't really know why, but uh, it kind of, uh, we kind of think maybe it's because it's written by guys from this country. We'll see. Um, so, if we do a proper timeline, we first encounter, encountered CDORC before Ebery. And uh, how did we link the two together? Well, first is there was a lot of uh, correlation in the IPs of the infection. So we realized most people infected with CDORC also are infected with Ebery. But another thing that we notice when we look closely at the, the, the code is this is the, the encryption function, so it's really cheap XOR uh, with multi-byte key. But we realized that the constant for the XOR are the same. So this is, a, in effect, the same thing. It's just the compiler produced it in, in the other way. But uh, you can see the, um, the same constant are used for the encryption. And this, this, those two indicators led us to really have a strong opinion that it's all operated by the same people. So. What did we do from there when we realized there were a lot of servers, uh, uh, an, an interesting pattern, you know, in, in the correlation of these binaries, is uh, we decided to reverse engineer the domain generation algorithm and to buy a domain to be able to get the credentials that were sent through DNS. And when we did that, we witnessed immediately 7,000 infected servers. And this is where we said, okay, we know it's big, uh, we, we need to, um, to do something about it. And when we started also cleaning people or telling them uh, how to remove CDOR component, a lot of time they were getting reinfected. And so this is why uh, we, we, this led us to, to think that this is really all about stolen credentials, that there are no exploits uh, used to, uh, to seed, if you want, this botnet. It's really, it, they're stealing exploits using SSH, and, and uh, this is how it, it's been uh, growing since the beginning. The last component of the, the operation, which is on the server side, if you want, is Perl uh, CalfBot, which is a Perl spamming daemon. It uh, deletes itself when it starts, so it resides only in memory. So you need to, uh, to core dump it, uh, if you want, uh, to, to get uh, the, the content. But since it's Perl, it's really complicated to reverse engineer inside the, the Perl interpreter. And it will hide itself as cron D. So, uh, you know, a simple dollar zero equals a string cron D, and, and, and it will run like that. Uh, what's interesting about CalfBot is that it will validate that the, the spam is successful. So every time it's get, it gets a job from the command and control server, it will uh, get a test job first. And the test job has a Gmail, and Yahoo, and Hotmail address to reach. And it will... Um, it will send to these fake, if you want. So these are operator-owned address, and it will send a test message with a, a specific uh, integer in it, and it will never get a send job until the, these, this test email was successfully sent. So when we implemented a fake bot, 
we needed to re-implement this same the same check. So we did actually send emails, but only the test emails and the the real emails were not sent. So uh, this makes it effective. As soon as they get blacklisted or the IP loses reputation, they they knew that uh, it wasn't effective already, and this is why it's been uh, efficient. We uh, noticed it uh, sending 35 million messages uh, a day, spam messages. And they are mostly, again, adult um, or casino or um, dating uh, type. A lot of dating lately. So this is the, we called it internally POSIX scalfbot as a joke, but the guy from our virus lab didn't really get it. But anyway. Uh, what we saw is uh, several uh, OSs that we're targeting, and in interestingly, uh, two of them were uh, Windows running the malware under SIGWIN, so which is interesting. <laughs> OS 10, a lot of BSDs, and in the unspecified, there were lots of things like ARM machines and stuff. And the way we were able to get this information is uh, because we, at some po at some moment, we uh, were having access to the command and control server, but not the ultimate command and control, but one in the middle, uh, which was doing running an Nginx reverse proxy. And we replaced the Nginx reverse proxy with one where we disabled the encryption. We had uh, someone from law enforcement all typing in those commands. And so we were able to put in, instead of using ephemeral Diffie-Hellman and all the strong you know, uh, cipher suite, we dropped it to AES-128, and we were able to steal the key because it was still there in this uh, intermediate server. And so we dumped PCAP then of, the, of this traffic, and we uh, were able, with the private key, to, to decrypt it. And this is where we saw the user agent strings, because it was using wget to do all the, the downloads. And so with all the user agent string, we were able to build this graph. This was pretty fun to do, breaking uh, SSL encryption uh, all legally with the help of law enforcement. I don't know if I will achieve something as fun as that uh, once again, I hope. So beyond the malware components, how is this operated? Well, we have a big uh, graph that is really heavy, and uh, we won't go to uh, too much detail. But what is important to know is that the, the victims or the users are in top uh, left hand, and the operators are bottom. In the middle, all of these are uh, servers compromised running Iberi, which are doing one of the various network evasion techniques that they do. I will cover them later. So they have four different techniques. The users are getting infected through um, a CDORC infected website, which is the web, the web threat I mentioned, and they are getting spam. And when the, uh, the, the server decides to run an exploit kit on a uh, victim, it will install the Glubteba malware, which is a Windows malware. So it will never target Linux desktop users. It's all, all uh, only targeting uh, Windows users. And Glubteba is another generic proxy component that is again used to send spam. So all of this is really only spam and adult uh, redirection. And so we were never able to reach to the bad guy at the bottom. We always had access only to intermediate machine, which means that if you work for OVH or for you know people like that, uh, please come and, and talk to us. I would be really interested uh, in having good contacts with people from these companies because a lot of servers are sitting at providers like that. Hetzner also in Germany. So I realized that uh, I'm taking I'm taking my time to talk. I thought I had 45 minutes though, but I guess it's questions at the end. So I'll go a bit quicker with the, the thing. So as I mentioned earlier, this is all about stolen credentials, and this is the way it steals them, but already covered them. Um, how come it, it has so many root credentials? Well, this is a graph of uh, the, the stolen credential we analyzed, and you can realize that 40% of the stolen credentials are root credentials. So, so this is what allows them to spread more. The money trail I already mentioned, so the exploit kit, Windows malware, and then spam, and uh, adult, adult affiliate program. So this is where they do their money. And the impact of this thing is uh, we noticed more than 25,000 compromised server. We saw half a million browser redirection per day with 20% going to exploit packs, 35 million spam sent daily, and kernel.org was infected at some point, and this is when they did their big um, you know, takedown and removing shells of people. We had some good contacts confirming us that uh, it was uh, Iberi infected. 
So why is this thing advanced? Because it's stealthy and because it's effective. For us, it was really the, the, the two things that made it interesting and worth um, going after. So the DevOps, why uh, are they DevOps? Well, they have an interesting uh, monitoring and deployment script and reconnaissance script, and they use SSH in an interesting way. What we've seen in the past is uh, they were W-getting code, and so you could, with a, a packet capture, get extract the code from the packet capture. But now they stream the code using SSH redirection and an interpreter, which means that we, not, we never have access to the code that they run, unless you build a man in the middle for SSH, which is what we did. We used uh, one from, <laughs> from signness.org, and we put up a very full interaction on EPOT to be able to steal the scripts. So the scripts are uh, written in Perl. They always report to st uh, standard out errors and status. So they are not obfuscated, but it's still Perl scripts. <laughs> what they do uh, with the type of code that they run is they eliminate evidence. So what, uh, here what this does is it will eliminate any log line that has a, the username that it used to connect to the system, failed password, or its IP address. In this, it will avoid all large files. This is what the find is doing. So any log file larger than 100 megabyte will not be uh, uh, cleaned. And it, it's fetching all the files to look for into the ATC sysconf um, uh, configuration and also everything under var log. The reconnaissance scripts are really interesting. They do, uh, they check extensively for anything LD preload related. So uh, most of the low interaction or uh, higher interaction honeypots are built using LD preload tricks. And so this will check this to avoid uh, being, uh, if you want, man in the middle or uh, investigated. It will check for various restrictive SSH configuration, and it will not deploy in these environments. And it will check for BSD jails, cPanel, BR admin, NGOs, uh, several different things like audit D if it's activated. The uh, one such example of a generic SSH honeypot, it, it will look in the strings for SSHD if certain strings are in there, like for a, a user local libexec, which is a jailed uh, SSH uh, thing, and it will uh, bail out if it sees stuff like that. The, the reconnaissance also detects available tools, so if it's able to uh, compile or if there is package management and, uh, present, it will, it will look for the headers if it can compile OpenSSH already without having to download them. And it will check if it's already installed, of course. The deployment script, so they, they pass uh, tarball with uh, all the code that they need or the, the pre-compiled uh, of the malware. And they used uh, Perl's data special literal to do that. So this is an example. Uh, the, the binary data usually is really binary. This, is, this was encoded by Vim. So normally, uh, after the data special literal, you will get you know, raw binary. And so they, they use this to pass the file, which means that, again, an external packet capture will not give you uh, the malware. You need to uh, man in the middle the thing. The, the deployment uh, script will also alter package management manifest. So it will install the new ash. So if you do a RPM check or a debsum, you will not get any warnings because it modified. So this is the code for the Debian version. It will go and remove the the hash of the file inside the varlib dpackage info, and it will put the hash of the malware inside, so uh, you will not find, uh, it will, it will seem like the system was not compromised. There, they use also an LD preload trick to be able to uh, install an RPM in the past, so that if you look at the RPM uh, information, the only thing that is different is the, the key ID uh, of the GPG because, yes, of course, they sign their malware with GPG, but they don't care about uh, key problems because they are root and they install the key or they use an installation mechanism that says don't check the key. But nonetheless, the thing is still signed. The um, daily monitoring script uh, is written in Bash, and it will uh, gather, you know, usernames and uh, uh, SSH keys and stuff like that. So if new users come on the server, uh, you, they will be able to still know and fetch their, the, these, uh, these usernames and, these, and those keys. Other findings, it will modify the SLNX policy. 
And instead of um, installing uh, or disabling uh, SLinux, like some of the more simplest malware do, uh, this thing installs a policy that is tailored for what it does. So it, it, it's really, it understood SLNX mo uh, more than most system administrators, you know. <laughs> Which was interesting. Yeah, props to them for taking the time to understand the thing. Um, so it does various uh, style of installation and it looks for over 40 backdoors and rootkit to be able to put them away and be the one on the server. And some of these were, are not uh, publicly documented. So we looked for some of, this of these strings, and uh, Google yells no result. So it has access to more malware than us uh, have access to. So we would like to get samples from them, but eh, they're not cooperating really. So yeah, I, I will skip the recap slide because I'm, uh, I have five minutes left. So forensic and incident response. Forensics is evidence gathering, process analysis, network analysis that I will cover. So you need to be careful uh, because you're running, if you do it in band, so inside the infected system, you're running at the same privilege level that, than the bad guys. So it's an arms race. They, like, I'm telling you how to use Netstat, but in a future version, they could provide a modified Netstat that will you know, remove the results that I'm telling you to do. So the better is always to be out of band and to do memory forensic and disk forensic, but it's a lot more uh, a, a tedious uh, process. But I'll still cover it later. So yeah, it's better to aim for out-of-band forensics. So how to spy on a user with the same privileges when it does all those tricks? Well, uh, we found out that AuditD is what worked best for us. Uh, I'll skip this because uh, AuditD is very nice and it really helped us a lot, but in the end, we needed to build a man-in-the-middle uh, to be able to have access to all of this. What, uh, what can you use to do process analysis? You can use Gcore to, to uh, dump the process and then use strings or GDB or IDA Pro to do proper reverse engineering. Um, uh, yeah, so this maybe is more advanced uh, if you want, but there was a reverse engineering tutorial yesterday. You could use the tools that were uh, rad Radar 2 toolkit uh, to do your, your reverse engineering also. Um, Something that I talk that the, a lot of the malware was deleted, I learned that uh, you can uh, bring back something that is running out of proc. So if you delete a, a binary, uh, you can still copy it from proc even though it says that it has been deleted, which has been really helpful, helpful for us to do the man in the middle I talked about earlier. Uh, and uh, more uh, tricks is that what you can do is you can uh, check what is the target of the exe that is running. So even if it's, it's hiding itself as cron, if you look inside proc, you'll be able to see if it's really user bin cron or uh, user bin pearl, which is hiding as cron. Uh, something that we, uh, I try to tell people to do is always get everything you can from PROC PID before killing a process or SIG stopping it because uh, in some cases we saw scripts that are encrypted and that the encryption key is in an env environment variable. So if you still have the malware but you killed it, you don't have the encryption key to analyze it because first thing it will do is decrypt itself and then do its malicious payload. Um, to do the process analysis, you can use LSOF, Netstat, IPCS, and stuff like that uh, to uh, S-trace to trace system call, L-trace to trace library calls. Uh, shared memory analysis is done with SHM cat if you want to output it into a file. I'll skip that. To do uh, Perl reverse engineering, you can use Perl TD to prettify the Perl, which is the first thing you could do. Uh, and then I use VI and I re rename variable, you know, using the, the quick key bindings. And if the script is uh, heavily packed, like uh, some of them are only brackets, thingies, you could use BD parse, which will do first step of uh, like uh, the p uh, extract from the P code instead of looking at the code. So you, you, you get more readable Perl, uh, but it's still Perl at the end. Uh, so the various network evasion I wanted to mention, but unfortunately I, I will run out of time, are SSH tunnels, Nginx reverse proxy, IP and IP tunnels, and tree proxy. Uh, the SSH tunnels are used for spam. You, you can find it uh, pretty easily looking in the process, uh, uh, looking for process of SSHD. The reverse Nginx, uh, Nginx proxy are used for the command and control servers and the exploit uh, pack. 
Uh, this is an example of the config they run. Uh, they use a lot the upstream server feature to uh, have load balancing and you know resilience if you ever take down one of the server. Uh, how do you find them? It's simple. You look for sockets or an or process. The IP and IP tunnels uh, are used to do to hide the, the they do uh, uh, credential brute forcing and uh, the general network scanning, and um, they they use several layers. So the IP tunnels are handled in the kernel, so they are, are harder to, uh, to find. But if you do IP tunnel show, you can find them. Um, or IP route show, you will see uh, tunnel uh, interfaces. Uh, this, this was very interesting for us, and we did some TTL analysis and really more, you know, again, offensive stuff against them, uh, which was uh, interesting. They also use IP tables to do port redirection. So you need to look also to uh, think about auditing your IP table rules if you want to find it. So just audit the thing. Tree proxy is a, a cross-platform protocol proxy server uh, that is not malware, uh, and sometimes it's renamed, so you need to look for it. Uh, again, you know, you, it's a process, so you will find it in the process list. So out of band forensic, I'll go really quickly, but uh, Wireshark, SSH man in the middle with the tool uh, we mentioned here. Uh, disk capture, dumping memory with, uh, in band with Lime. Uh, out of band, you can use virtualization snapshots if you have uh, the if you run your server in a virtual machine. Um, memory analysis, you you can use volatility. Uh, we release indicators of compromise, but as I said earlier, every time we published about something, they adapted to it. So what we prefer to do now is uh, tell people to contact us, and if you provide us with a proof of that you're not you know, a malware operator, then uh, we will send you the latest indicators of compromise we've got. And so an example of a reaction is that after we release our report, they uh, updated their, their malware to avoid uh, the thing, and they added in the strings of the malware, good job, Eset, and thanks for Ida. Pro was leaked from our company a long time ago. It was stolen from an analysis machine, so uh, they, they kind of joked at us a little bit. <laughs> but it means they read our report, which is good. So uh, incident response quickly. I, I Just don't be in denial. Reinstall everything from scratch. And be really careful to not reuse credentials that you use, because uh, you will get reinfected, and we've seen it a lot. Uh, ideally, consider implementing a password policy to prevent passwords from being reused. Uh, but uh, again, this might be more complex, and this is something we don't see often in servers. Uh, another way to completely prevent a threat like that is to use two-factor authentication. So anything like Google Authenticator would prevent the thing because it relies only on stolen credentials. And so if you have two-factor, uh, you, you, it, it won't work. Uh, one thing I like to do when I have some time is like, every, who uses two-factor for their Gmail and Hotmail or Twitter? And a lot of people raise hand. And then, who uses it for servers? And then, no one. Yeah, nice. We have like five people. Good job, guys. Yeah. So recap. And then uh, logs. I, I think we should ask system developers to make logs harder to temp temper, to have some live CD to verify package integrity instead of doing it from the system. Uh, and things that should make a Linux system more resistant to attacks, but uh, unfortunately, I think this will take time, but uh, system D with journal D is doing forward uh, sealing, which should be a technique you can use to detect that your logs were tampered with. So yeah, uh, the reason we, gave, we talk at conferences is to spread the word about these type of threats and uh, so that people like you who get sometimes asked about Linux malware or, and or have to react in some cases know what to do. So uh, I hope that uh, this was uh, helpful and I, you, you will be able to refer to the slides to you know, grab the list of commands that I went quickly through. Uh, but. Uh, Let's uh, work together to make the ecosystem more resistant to uh, attacks like that. And if you find anything suspicious, uh, we are always interested in looking at uh, malicious code. And uh, we often can quickly assess if it's malicious or not. And then it takes a longer time to analyze if it's something completely new and uh, very uh, obfuscated and packed. So thank you very much. So we have about five minutes for a few questions. Let's see.
so we'll start. Um, we'll go one, two. You talked about the tools like IP tables, IP route OS, etc. Don't most of those toolkits replace those anyway, and so you can't trust them? What do you do about that problem? So the in this specific, is my mic still on? In this uh, specific case, we know that uh, they, they weren't modifying these uh, binaries because we were able to notice the way they were infecting the, the computer. So in these cases, we were relying on them. Uh, in, in the cases where you, know, uh, you, you don't know what you are uh, investigating, then of course it's always better to go completely out of band and you know, look from a disk uh, image perspective what the bank binaries are. And once you confirm that they are clean or not, then you know, do uh, trust them or not trust them. But it's a very, a very hard problem, of course. Um, you mentioned that it would actually check if it was already installed uh, before it would like infect the system. I mean, it was possible to like trick it into thinking you were already compromised to prevent it installing itself. Yeah, yeah, someone could do that definitely. But again, you know, at this point, it's already running code on your machine, so you <laughs> would prefer to close that door, right? <laughs> but uh, so yeah, it's using the um, it's using the shell that it gets from the back door. So in effect, like if if you're running the back door, you are kind of infected. Uh, so I guess I, I, I would need to look what specific test it does to detect if it's installed, and then if we could easily emulate it. But it's probably something like uh, looking at uh, the, the binary or the presence of the file and the file size. But uh, yeah, I have the script. I, I might look at it later. Could you put a box between your server and the rest of the internet which only did check the traffic going through for this stuff? Yeah, so when we released our report, we released uh, snort rules, which is unusual for an antivirus company, uh, to be able to do just that, like uh, being uh, alerted when uh, you are infected. So we did that. Okay, so this will be a second last question. Um, what would you say is the three or four things that the sysadmin should be doing to protect our servers from these sorts of attacks, not just this one, but in general? So uh, the Linux threats are really mostly about uh, bad practices. If you, uh, your user's password are good, so like uh, cracklib for me would be one of the first thing I would do if I was a shared hoster, you know, who I would have users having dozens of, you know, cat websites and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, uh, making sure credentials are really better, even disabling passwords uh, entirely. No root login, please. Seriously, like uh, disable this thing, remote uh, root login. What about root my SSH key? Well, OK, so uh, the, this thing steals SSH keys, so they are aware of this possibility. But of course, uh, to get it stolen in the first place, it's uh, harder. And what I would advise uh, people is to really be good with SSH keys and never forward them to server. Use SSH agent if you need to. Uh, you know, do uh, hop from servers to servers. Uh, but yeah, okay, so SSH key as root then is a matter of, you know, personal choice. And what is good if you use SSH key for root is that, or for non-root, I, I, I should say, is that uh, after you get inside the server, you still need to sudo. And if you log in with a key and you use a password for sudo, then you kind of have two different credentials that they need to steal instead of just one. So, uh, you know, it's all about risk analysis, but the people that are infected are really lousy, uh, sloppy admins uh, uh, so far, you know, and everyone in here, I'm pretty sure, would, uh, would maybe know someone infected, but wouldn't be directly affected, unless they haven't updated their box and their password since a long time. Hi, quick question about um, SE Linux. You said that um, some of the malware is shipping their own SE Linux policies. Wouldn't that be a dead giveaway because you'd have to publish the policies in the kernel or have they actually done something to the kernel SE Linux modules to actually hide the policies as well? No, the, it's, it's right there for you to see, but it's altering SSHD's policy already. Uh, is it SSHD or HTTPD? I don't remember, but it's altering, you know, one of the pieces uh, already existing policies, not creating a new one. And so you could like, 
wonder and the policy it adds is for this binary like a star slash star or something like that so it's pretty obvious of course but you know it, it was able to hide itself in um, IP tables it was able to hide itself and in, in stuff like that so of course anyone use, using like tripwire or stuff that would detect configuration changes would be notified uh, but I guess a lot of the, the sloppier admins are not auditing their SLinux configuration uh, Often enough. Yeah, so I say Linux is still safe. It just you gotta yes. slowly look at yeah, 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 policies. Yes. Okay, yeah. thanks. Thank you very much for your presentation today, Olivia. Thanks. And we also have a small gift just from Linux conference to say thank you today. Thank you.